Hello, everyone. My name is Katerina Arjaev, and I am the Director of Product Management for Healthcare Edge at SUSE. Today, I'll talk to you about the opportunities and challenges of cloud-native technology in U.S. health tech. Now, I know that in the description for this session, I said I would give you a strategic playbook for going into this giant market and making sure that your solutions are accessible to all of the different users in the different spaces of the market. If I could do that in 25 minutes, I would be a very rich person. So my goal is to make sure that you leave this session today with more questions than answers that you can then take into your personal research and conversations to make sure that the solutions you're designing, the questions you're asking are appropriate and can make your ultimate cloud native choices uh, scalable for the long term. First, I want to talk about where health tech plays in the US market. This is the business to mission critical spectrum. And a lot of the time when we talk to designers and architects, they'll say that the choices that they need to make are mission critical. And sometimes they're right. If you look at the far edge of the business critical, you'll notice retail and automotive sectors. And in these places, you could find a retailer, a home goods store, who is perhaps in an area that is prone to natural disasters, earthquakes, or hurricanes. And if their point of sale system goes down and the community isn't able to purchase sandbags for flooding or electrical supplies to fix their homes, then yes, this could be a mission critical scenario for that community. But ultimately, if the system goes down beyond discomfort, frustration, or loss of revenue, there aren't that many big consequences that require the strict regulations that you'll see on the other side of the spectrum. This is the mission critical space. Here you'll find aerospace and defense. These industries are part of an ecosystem, political, economic, and have mechanisms and regulations in place that often maintain social order. If these systems goes down, you could find crisis on your hands and devastation with loss of life. Full recovery here is expected within an hour. But healthcare plays in a very interesting place here. It's not quite mission critical because of the amount of expertise and time that this industry has had throughout the various generations of both behavior and technology, but also because there are certain regulations in place that prevent decisions to be made that can cause significant loss of life. Later, I'll talk about a use case for an imaging system. And when these imaging systems are updated, they are scheduled for an in-person technician to come and do the upgrade when there is not a surgery happening. But sometimes the worst case scenarios happen and you do need to make sure that within a day, there is full recovery of the environment and the system. The state of healthcare overall in the United States, if you dig a little deeper, has started to shift from even using the terminology healthcare to the care of health. And this is because you have providers and payers and patients, all of whom are trying to refocus healthcare from just being another vertical to something that is really focused on the individual who needs care and will require medicine and that technology to support them at any point in their life. So healthcare at best becomes individual. And when you're architecting a cloud native system going from something legacy on premises, you need to make sure that the support is there for an on genetic level, provide care to the patients. Healthcare, unfortunately, then at its worst, becomes regional. You are restricted by the community centers, the hospitals in the, in the environment, the kind of legacy infrastructure decisions for telecommunications that can influence the ability of you to select certain solutions and products over others as you design. However, health tech, on the other hand, at best, is global leveraging all of the resources of the experts in the European Union, the manufacturing capabilities of Asian countries, building for something that was identified as an individual need in a small city in California in the United States. At worst, health tech 
is regional because you don't have the ability to scale and bring your designs and your solutions, your products, to more remote regions or other places on the planet where these problems are also being faced. Health tech then becomes a conversation about delivering maximum care for the maximum number of people while understanding your limitations in a paradoxically uh, very constrained world. The American healthcare ecosystem, very grossly simplified on the screen in front of you, has a lot of different players. And that continues to add the complexity that outside of globalization or cultural differences or behaviors really influences the way that we can design for the long term. And throughout this conversation, I'll talk a lot about medical technology, especially in the enterprise and startup space. So you can see that those are the two green boxes in the center. But what does the rest of the environment look like? And how does it influence us as architects when we're trying to build something for the future? First, let's talk about the users, the patients who need care, the providers and healthcare delivery organizations, the doctors and nurses who provide that care, and the payers in the United States the ability to deliver care is very, very influenced by insurance companies and payers make decisions about the kind of risk they're willing to take and make on behalf of patients and providers. As a personal victim of the US healthcare system, I have had to navigate these environments where you find yourself being advertised to to use a product for your certain condition, having to go to the provider, the doctor, advocating that they go to the hospital staff and administration and make sure that that is in the surgery room when you as the patient receive care. You find yourself in a situation where unfortunately the insurance companies think that this is uh, too new and too risky to pay for and so they refuse and you settle for lesser options. However, the companies that are delivering these technologies, tools, med tech point solutions and pharmaceutical companies across startups and enterprises have started to understand that they have the different buyers and decision makers as well as strategic influencers and they have made decisions to focus either regionally with their global perspective on technology or otherwise not even going into this market because of the mass requirement of navigation. And they also understand that the regulatory bodies, industry associations, and professional service providers all have a massive influence on the kind of market acquisitions that they can make as well as entrance. Regulatory bodies on one hand, proactively create structures that prevent loss of life or devastation, those kinds of consequences that patients need to avoid, but on the other hand are extremely reactive when it comes to the innovations of enterprise med tech companies or pharmaceutical innovations. And we saw a lot of this during the COVID-19 pandemic where an already extremely stressed system was put under more stress, not just by patients, but by the availability of care and the delivery of that care to individuals via regional channels developed on a global level. So when you think about architecting solutions, understand the decisions and the guidance from regulatory bodies, the industry associations that will influence providers and patients, as well as the professional service providers who ultimately can make really significant top-down decisions on the availability of the solutions and their comfort with this risk. So let's look at a use case, as I mentioned, med tech, right? A mobile surgical imaging system developed by, let's say, the largest med tech company in the world, Medtronic, that is found to provide a solution to a problem in the United States. The designers live in Germany, they're going to manufacture parts in Brazil and Venezuela, build and compile this system in China, and then sell it again in the United States. These 
mobile surgical imaging systems are put in a hospital room, and it takes months to build out that room, because even though mobile is in the title, it is quite immobile and takes some time and investment. But the tool itself has the ability for real-time data processing. It's built with legacy in mind, because it's not just coming out of thin air. It is being built on version 4 or 5 that 25 years ago was developed with the technology of that time, usually built on Windows 95 that is still in operations today. But the operational resiliency requirements that are often provided by cloud native solutions are really interesting to Medtronic, who on a global level understands that they can grow and scale if they have the financial incentives to do so. And finally, this tool is expected to operate indefinitely. And I put indefinitely in quotes here because this is not something like an aerospace where you build a satellite and you send it to Mars for 20 to 200 years. But at the same time, if you look at the timelines of development from at the top of the screen, you'll see the product development cycle, followed by in purple the business and strategic development, and then finally the overall market lifespan of this mobile surgical imaging system. You will find that, yes, in the world of Kubernetes, in the world of cloud native, and the fast pace of innovation we have, this is quite indefinite. It will take anywhere from six months on the very best case scenario where an enterprise like Medtronic would come to a solution provider with an already created proof of concept and the requirement just to provide something like services or support to three years where an entire system is designated to need to move towards containerized applications for the newest version of that device. If you look at the purple timeline, you then notice that between the 2022 proof of concept and risk retirement, you find that commercialization of the product will only happen four years later in 2026. A lot of things can happen in four years. Four years ago, we would not be in this room today because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the decisions made internally in the company, for example, reorganizations, can force architects into places of delay or support cycles on Kubernetes will move on or new technologies will be innovated and come to market. A lot of things can happen and building with resiliency in mind can prevent some of this, but unfortunately at one point, the architects of these systems find themselves in a situation where they ultimately need to put a stop and write this validated design that at one point will become outdated. However, you also understand that Beyond the technology, healthcare has so many documentation and regulatory requirements. And so if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will see the full market timeline, which is about a 20-year lifespan of this one system. And between that, you have regulatory delays, anywhere from one to three years. And I'll talk about this later when I talk about the paradox of the regulatory bodies that require high uh, regulatory approvals despite trying to be innovative in their approach. But a lot of things can happen in three years, and companies that are building mobile surgical imaging systems will be able to bring to market their device, for example, in the United States or in Canada, and then be prevented from using the same life-saving technology in other markets, which is harmful to the consumer. And a lot of the approach from regulatory bodies in the United States now is to try to proactively understand this and simplify the processes while also balancing the need for overall patient health. So as I mentioned, a strategic playbook, like this is such a good word to have, and I, I, wish, I wish I had a real one. But unfortunately, besides telling you the importance of fostering interoperability between the legacy systems and behaviors of doctors, the importance of enhancing telehealth to bridge the global health, health tech to individual healthcare divide, and empowering data analytics so that there can be further enhanced compliance with regulations and regulatory bodies, the health tech and healthcare world in the United States, of course, quantifying, is extremely paradoxical. And depending on the knowledge and risk tolerance of different individuals, you'll be forced into the worst case scenarios and bad decisions that you know won't last the full 20 years. A paradox is absurd, but when you really dig into it, it's the truth. And so I think that one of the 
benefits and opportunities that the people in this room have is that you're coming to this with a very fresh approach. In the United States, you have so much legacy behaviors, and that is our first paradox, the technological paradox. Healthcare is both incredibly high tech. There is implanted medical devices, hackable devices actually, keeping people alive on a genetic level. However, the overall system is about three decades behind in terms of technological innovation. Even now, 10 years after Kubernetes went to market, you have companies that are just beginning their containerization journeys. And this is because when they build devices like the medical imaging systems, they are building on a device that they started developing 25 years ago, and they need to make sure that those systems still in the field today are properly supported. But if you look at some of these facts, you become even more discouraged. 75% of medical communication in the United States is fax. Faxed. Guys, like this is, like, I, I don't understand how this is possible as someone who knows that I'll need to really rely on the medical system, but no matter how much you fight it, you could be in the most technologically advanced city in Washington DC or New York, and your doctor who is using an iPad and has an ambient voice system documenting your conversation will say, well, I'll just fax this really quickly. 70% of these providers also use legacy systems. I mentioned Windows 95, and this wasn't a joke. The average organization creates more than 1,000 unique applications and puts them in use in their environments, all of which are really outdated if you actually look at them and understand that these user interfaces are probably very reflective of a game from the old computer days called Minesweeper. It feels like you're in a mine when you're trying to navigate this environment. In addition, the healthcare sector in the United States doesn't have enough people. And so right now, 14% of the US working population in the United States is close to retirement. We're going to be losing a lot of our nurses and doctors, and they carry with them not just the legacy uh, health knowledge and health care, but the technological choices that were made and implemented in all of their practices. And this really affects companies and architects who are trying to make solutions that they want to benefit humanity and scale and grow. There is a wonderful company called Butterfly Network that created the first handheld ultrasound machine, and they put ultrasound machines in the hands of doctors in really remote and, uh, parts of the world in Africa, enabling uh, fetal care in those areas. And in, a, in order to do that, they had to first bring smart devices. And in order to bring smart devices, you have to train people on the upgrade processes of those smart devices. To do that, you need to make sure that the telecommunications networks are in place. And to do that, you want to make sure that the, the community is even accepting of these practices. That's the first paradox. And unfortunately, the amount of solutions that you can come up with to solve these problems are going to be really dependent and unique to the challenges that you're solving. So when you think about expanding into the US market, you don't just say, OK, my one solution to the whole US market. Think of the individual end user. Think of the providers that are going to deliver that to them. And think of the payers and their influence with the regulatory bodies, industry associations, and other partnerships that you can make. The second paradox is regulation. right? Always, always about regulation. You need to make sure that you're creating the most detailed documentation that nobody will read, 200 pages worth about your device and the decisions that you made and the processes that will take. The paradox is that healthcare needs to be highly individualized to the genetic level in order to make a true difference. That is where the industry is heading. However, you also need to maintain the strict standards, for example, that health tech has on a global level in order to scale, in order to deliver, in order to have best practices in place and leverage the knowledge and insights across the globe. 64% increase in regulations for device manufacturers since 2015 have hit the market. 64% increase. There are more than 10,000 different regulations in the United States, from the way that insurance providers will approve different devices to the way that those devices can be delivered to patients, to the longevity of those devices. $31 million is the average cost for participants to bring a device to the 510K process. And in the United States, 510K is a secondary process. It assumes that you've already gone through pre-market approvals and have already gotten your device initially approved. And now you're just approving the next version. 
24 million of this is only spent on FDA food and drug related administration activities, right? This is just this one regulatory system that takes care of managing all of the different regulations related to medical devices in the United States. And the average time it takes is three years. Now this number is global, right? This assumes that your solution is going to go to all of the different remote regions of the world. You're going to navigate the Chinese, Japanese, Australia, and the United States, um, Europe's requirements and regulations as well. So you could go to market faster if you have maybe a small device that is already recognized. But if you're truly innovating, if you have some kind of record approach to data security, zero trust, data resiliency, you're going to find it difficult to convince not just the regulators, but the market and the consumers as well that this is the best approach to take based on the technology that they don't understand, they don't want to pay for, and they don't want to use. One of the challenges is that there was a medical manufacturer, and they had this great imaging device. And they went to the doctors and they said, look, if you use this imaging device, you can save your patients' lives. It's like 50% more lives saved. And the doctor was appalled. How dare you say that I am not doing a good job, that I am causing 50% deaths? And this kind of behavior will impact any transformative tool from going to the market, from people finding out about it. And at the very last paradox, there's like two more. I'll tell you one of the approaches that you can take in order to start going against this behavior. But unfortunately in healthcare, it does come down to the fact that you're not fighting a technological fight. Like, cloud native is great. We've been here for a week. We, like, we've heard all about how great it is. We believe in it. That's why we're here. But it's convincing the people, the behavior specialists, the individuals who don't want to believe that their career could have been better. They could have saved more lives. The third data is, the third paradox is data, right? Healthcare data needs to be highly secured with restricted access controls in place, but if a patient asks for their data, they need to have immediate access and it needs to be immediately transferable. This is because patients are finding more freedom and flexibility and going to different providers. They're more mobile and globalized. They're moving to different places and they need to be able to take their data with them. This is also a very strong reaction to the behavior of charging consumers and not telling them what you're charging them for. And so a lot of the trauma that Americans will have with the healthcare system is after perhaps going through a routine surgery or giving birth, something very normal, they will find that they've been charged $200 for a pain medicine or a certain amount for something that they never received that happened on a monitor somewhere down the hall. So regulators are very reactively starting to address these problems, but they're also reacting to something that is a little bit more scary and dangerous, and that is the amount of harm and hacking and security risks that are being put and threatening the healthcare system. Healthcare overall in the globe is one of the top three most attacked industries. And during the pandemic, this did ease up a little bit because we were all going through collective trauma, but now it's back again. And patient data, patient systems, hospitals are all under risk. And they need to make sure that the systems they have in place are up to date. What this is doing is pushing modernization and transformation, sometimes in environments where there is no funding, there is no knowledge, and it's remote. So they are push the hospital systems themselves are the ones pushing back against regulation. This is where having the ability for telehealth as well as data analytics becomes very important. If you have doctors and providers who are able to deliver your solutions in a remote or telehealth type capacity, you increase the ability to make your solutions applicable beyond the individual level. One in four consumers have had their healthcare data stolen, and this is not because of the ability to transfer their data. It is because of the inability of that data to be secured. And on the bottom of the screen, you'll see a timeline. This is from a healthcare professional, healthcare delivery organization that is trying to communicate to their consumers about the timeline at which they're going to create transparency in the costs of their tools. And as you can see, it was only in quarter one of this year when they actually said that cost estimations are going to be available for all of their services. Services. This is very reactive. We're in 2024. Can you imagine that an organization delivering health 
care to 20,000 people is only now able to provide transparency of costs. Now these consumers are empowered to take those costs and go to other providers that they can know, perhaps deliver it in a more financially feasible way. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if this organization at its scale is able to do that, whereas if I live in a very remote area, I don't have the ability, even as a provider in my own practice, to implement these tools and solutions that exist on the market and have existed in a containerized way for quite some time. This is all very dark and sad, I'm sorry. But there is a solution, and of course it has to be a paradox, right? The solution is coopetition. Coopetition is a word that was invented about 25, 30 years ago now, and it's the combination of cooperation and competition. And it hasn't been used a lot, but we've seen it more and more after the problems of the US healthcare system were exponentially highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic, behaviorally and technologically. So the first step is to understand. Understand the market, assess the go-to-market strategy of the products and the solutions, address the users and their needs, and be very intentional and specific. Through this 25-minute conversation, you get a little bit of that, so I'm gonna make it great. Like, let's pretend we already know that, right? The second step is to cooperate regionally, form strategic partnerships, engage with those professional organizations, and leverage the channel partners that have a direct connection and a line of communication to those markets, those individuals, and those regions. But compete globally. We need to continue to build trust and credibility through continuous innovation that will speed on despite the decisions we're making today for a product that will hit the market in four years. This is very important because it allows the acceleration and transfusion of scale of these solutions, of these design decisions, of cloud native principles, all at the edge at scale, right? So if we have an opportunity to go and talk to a professional health organization like Chime or Health in the United States and get them to encourage all of their users and providers, we now have direct access to consumers. And in the United States, influencing the patient and consumer behavior becomes the pr pr pivotal priority for getting any kind of advancement in the market itself. And this will allow us to compete globally, building solutions that with a little bit of editing or creative design will be able to leverage that documentation that you've built for both regulatory approvals but also the same behavioral issues faced. Because at the end of the day, the American market is special. I say that because I think it's one of the few markets I understand in and out, but human behavior and the things that guide humans are pretty much the same. And healthcare, as the oldest profession in human history, can really benefit from the global approach and the lessons that we take. So we start minimizing these divides between Western and Eastern medicine. So I think that is a little bit of a positive note on which to end this presentation. And I open the floor to your questions. I would love to continue this conversation. Thank you. feel the pain. Uh, we have to integrate with this thing called Faxio <laughs> that uh, helps doctors fax information to other doctors. So um, we are starting to implement uh, LLMs and AI into our software uh, much more. Uh, we, we've implemented them behind the scenes, but now we're trying to implement them more dynamically for the providers to be able to use them with the patients. How do you envision um, providers kind of reacting to, to, to LLMs in their workforce in their work, as a product person? One of my favorite conversations that I had was about an ambient voice system. So ambient voice is a system that you put in a room and as you're having a conversation with the doctor, it writes everything down. And I've been in rooms where I watch the system write what I say and it will put a comma in the wrong place or put do instead of don't, it will miss things. And unfortunately, humans really like the easiest path, the path of least resistance. And when you have doctors who are either very professional, live in New York, work in New York, have a massive hospital network, wear the white coats and, and feel like they're on a TV show, 
uh, they're going to use those systems because it is the thing everyone is talking about. It's the, the thing that is supposed to save the hospital money and they're going to use it even if they have personal qualms against it. On the other end, you'll have doctors who are the only healthcare provider in a 200 kilometer radius who are overwhelmed by the amount of care that they need to deliver to their community, who care so much that they're driving themselves into an early grave, who will put these systems in place as an attempt to expedite and increase efficiency. So again, this could be New York City and a another city, right? So it's the same region, but it's two different reasons to use this technology. And it, as, as a patient, it will make me very anxious to know that my healthcare decisions are made by algorithms, even though they've been made by algorithms for the last 20 years. Um, but I think that we can't stop this flow of innovation and technology. And as product managers and as solution creators and architects and designers, we need to be really aware that the decisions we make that are okay to use in business critical environments need to be reconsidered or perhaps considered a little bit more in mission critical environments because the decisions we make today will influence the future in a very significant way. Another interesting example is the creation of rockets. You know, you're building a rocket and you really want a really big uh, fuel chamber. And you say, you draw it on paper and it's amazing and the rocket's going to go really far, really fast. It's going to save a lot of money. And then somewhere three months later, you find out that, oh, you can't build a rocket that big because it has to go on a train through a tunnel and the tunnel is this big. So that tunnel was built. 30, 40, 200 years ago, who knows? But that person, when they were making that decision to build that tunnel, didn't think that a rocket ship would have to go through it on a train. And we're making decisions now that are going to be put in a hospital room and used by people in 20 years, like the same system that we're building. And we're getting really, really creative with the kinds of decisions that we can make. And we need to make sure that those decisions are sustainable and scalable. And at least document it. Just, guys, please, just document everything. <laughs> I hope that kind of answers your question. Thanks. Yeah, it does. Appreciate it. It's a conversation. It's ever happening and ever flowing. And the good news is that you have a lot of time with healthcare systems. You have a lot of time, unfortunately, right? Good and bad. And the considerations that you make can only ever be as good as the information you have, right? Hindsight is 20, 20. It's a phrase you, I knew better in the past. Don't let that stop you. Use the best judgment that you have, but also be really intentional about whether you're designing for business critical or mission critical. Because while some of the cloud native principles and scenarios are applicable across all of the industries I showed on slide two, three, this one, when you move into mission critical environments, you start having these loss of life and loss of a life, loss of life scenarios, right? And I would really not like to be on the receiving end of one of my decisions in 30 years affecting either someone I know or someone I don't know. I really appreciate your time today. I know it's Friday. It's the last day of the conference. Uh, but I hope that what I shared today is going to give you the kinds of questions you can ask and research uh, for your future design choices. Thank you.